Hey guys, Heidi Preeb here. Happy New Year. This is a video that I made at the end of last year reviewing the best books that I read in the year and I decided to do it again this year because one of the number one questions that I always get asked is what books do you recommend on like whatever topic I cover, whether that is dysfunctional family roles, whether it's attachment style, whether it's Myers-Briggs. There are no Myers-Briggs books in this video, so if that's what you're here for, you might want to exit now. This year I read a shit ton, probably more than I've ever read in a single year in my life. So I attempted to make a list of the 10 best books that I read in 2021, turn into a list of the 12 best books because I could not narrow it down to 10, and then I also include something like 10 more honorable mentions. So it's a list of like 25 books, but I will try to keep it kind of short, as short as I can. And hopefully some of these suggestions are helpful for you guys. If you're looking for ways to further your own knowledge of a lot of the topics that we talk about on this channel in the year 2022. So before we get started, I don't wanna make the books feel bad. So I just wanna add the disclaimer that to me, a good book is a book that changes my way of thinking about something. So when I'm ranking these books internally, I'm not necessarily thinking about like, what is the most eloquently written book or which book packed in the most information in the least amount of time. I'm thinking about which books did I read that personally really made me think about things in a completely different way. And so some of these books, ironically, may have been much higher up on my list had I read them in a different order, for example. So take this list with a grain of salt because it is completely subjective, as is every individual's list of their favorite things. But I am here to share my subjective opinions, so here we go. Twelfth best book I read this year was the book Bradshaw on the Family by John Bradshaw. If you watch my videos, you hear me constantly reference John Bradshaw. He was an incredible psychologist who talks a lot about family dynamics and who introduces a really wide range of family systems in a very accessible way. So if you have, let's say, watched my Dysfunctional Family Roles series and you want to start getting a little bit more into family roles, or if you are just curious about family dynamics in general, John Bradshaw gives a really good overview in this book that will point you to different systems that you can research more. And he is very accessible to read. He speaks really clearly and really directly to the layman. You don't need all of this complex psychological background to understand anything he writes. He is a very talented and a very accessible writer. So this book, Bradshaw on the Family, is a really great intro to dysfunctional family stuff. 11th best book that I read this year, I read this one on Audible, so I cannot show it to you with my hands but The Pocket Guide to Polyvagal Theory by Stephen Porges. So this book is not the most accessible book in the world. It is written by a neuroscientist for other neuroscientists, but he's tried to kind of trim it down and make his work a little bit more accessible in this guide. And the reason why I recommend it is once again, not because it's a super entertaining read, but because polyvagal theory is starting to pop up everywhere in psychology. So if you are interested in psychology, you're probably going to see this theory referenced quite a bit. And this book introduces it in a very thorough way. There's also a book called Befriending Your Nervous System by Deb Dana that I never finished, but I started to read that offers a much more accessible intro to polyvagal theory. I just don't feel comfortable recommending it because I only read like two chapters. And then I was like, eh, I think I'm max out on polyvagal theory stuff for this year. But I recommend getting into the theory because I think that especially if you have an interest in family roles, attachment style stuff, you're gonna see this theory popping up over and over and over again. And it really does give you a bit more nuance and understanding of how the neurobiology of attachment and interpersonal psychology really affects us on a physiological level. So it's really cool to have that kind of layered approach to it. So that made it book number 11 for me. Book number 10. I want to put a huge disclaimer in front of this book is super sexist and super homophobic. And the reason it is both of those things is because it was written in, I believe, 1964. You can fact check me on that, but it was a while ago. And this was a time when homophobia was still in the DSM as a mental illness. And there was rampant sexism in the media. So there are a lot of tropes in this book that absolutely would not fly in modern times. But if you can take that with a grain of salt, it is a really interesting read. And this book is called Games People Play by Eric Byrne. Now, this book is an intro to the field of transactional analysis. And the field of transactional analysis is once again, one that is super closely related to attachment. And this book talks a lot about the subtext that's going on beneath the surface of everyday conversations. And I really wanted to include this in my top 10, even though I felt like it should come with a giant disclaimer because it really helped me to think differently about the conversations that I was having with people, about these kind of cyclical or repetitive interpersonal problems that I would have in certain relationships and it helped me gain language for why 
I kept running into the same roadblocks with certain people. Or why, in certain cases in the present or the past, I couldn't break a dynamic even though I knew it wasn't serving me. So the field of transactional analysis kind of talks a lot about what conversations we're really having when we have certain conversations. So if you've ever had the experience of like having a giant fight with someone and then being like, that fight wasn't really about that. This book maps out a whole bunch of different games that people are actually playing out in relationship with one another and that often lead to these kind of big blow up like fights or conflicts or whatever it is that don't seem to make any sense. So it's kind of taking your average everyday conversation and going beneath the surface of it in a way that is very interesting. And even if you don't take the book completely literally, like if you don't see yourself in the specific games they're referencing, it just helps you think in a very different way. Like going into a conversation that feels frustrating or difficult kind of has a different context to it once you start getting versed in transactional analysis and understanding it in a little bit more depth. So if you like the drama triangle, if you've read the book, the drama triangle, or if you like my videos on the drama triangle, I think you're also gonna like games people play because it's very similar. The field of transactional analysis very much includes the drama triangle. That was book 10, right? Yeah, I've already lost count. Okay, book nine, the book Mindsight by Daniel Siegel. And I recommend this book mostly because I just want everyone to get into Daniel Siegel. People are always asking me for attachment book recommendations and I'm always like, just don't read Attached. That is truly the worst book on attachment I've ever read. It completely and totally bastardizes the theory. I'm not gonna do my whole rant on it. I might make a video that it's just a rant on that book in the future. But I do have this struggle where I don't have a single book on attachment that I feel comfortable recommending to people at this point, other than like my textbook that is a thousand pages long. But Daniel Siegel is an author who has written something like 50 books. Like if you go on Amazon and look up Dan Siegel, you have pages and pages and pages of Amazon pages for his books. And Mindsight is not an attachment book, but it is a really good intro to Dan Siegel's work. It talks a lot about how we can use self-awareness and the science behind self-awareness to understand ourselves, to improve ourselves, to gain just better clarity on the human condition. And I think that it is a really great book for anyone who's just interested in getting an intro to neuropsychology without knowing anything going in. So I found his books very easy to read. I had to read some pages multiple times to get it to fully sink in. But Daniel Siegel is just such an amazing author who has so many good things written about attachment and about the neuroscience of attachment and about how children's minds develop. And I think that this is just a good book to start familiarizing yourself with his work. And it's just a great psychology book. Like it's really great for understanding how the mind works and how self-awareness develops. Book number eight is the one that I read the most recently. I think I read it like the second last week of this year, so it just snuck in under the wire, but it is The Betrayal Bond by Patrick Carnes. And this is one that is not directly related to attachment either, but I think that if you identify as either anxiously attached or fearful avoidant, this book is a really fantastic resource. It talks about how early wounding can cause us to repeatedly and continuously seek out relationships that are exploitive, either in one or both directions. And this is a really common problem for people who are insecurely attached of any attachment style. So if you are insecurely attached, The Betrayal Bond can be a very enlightening book. I really recommend that you do the exercises. There are some really powerful self-reflection tools in this book. So if you actually use those tools for their intended purposes, you can get a lot out of it. Book number seven is definitely the most like esoteric book on my list, maybe, but it is Conversations with God, The Complete Trilogy by Neil Donald Walsh. So this is basically a book by a guy who claims that he's channeling God. I believe he used to be really heavily involved in the church and then he left the church. So if you go to the Amazon reviews, you will see that this book does not translate perfectly to Christianity and it offends a lot of Christians on the contrary. But as someone who is more or less agnostic, I found it to be a really fun thought experiment. So it's basically a three book long conversation between this man and his idea of God and they tackle all of the major problems of the world and what God thinks about them. And again, this is not the Christian ideal of a God. It kind of actually reminded me of, there is a book called God's Debris by Scott Adams. Was that his name? Yeah, Scott Adams. He wrote the Dilbert comics and then wrote this book that was a thought experiment about what if God basically had disintegrated and we were all just like little debris or pieces left over of God trying to reassemble itself. That's not the exact philosophy here, but it's not too dissimilar. It's also very similar to A Course in Miracles, if you're at all familiar with that material, which we will get to later in this list. But it is considerably less um, 
theology heavy. Like it references Christian literature quite a bit because the author comes from a very Christian background, but it's not preaching Christianity. But anyways, I would kind of categorize it as philosophical. And I think that it presents a lot of really interesting perspectives that are really fun to think about. Book number six, The Body Never Lies by Alice Miller. So you probably know Alice Miller from the book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, which absolutely everyone it seems like who's ever taken a passing interest in psychology has read. I remember reading that book and being like, I don't know, this didn't do that much for me. Why is everyone so crazy about Alice Miller? And then I read The Body Never Lies and I was like, oh, this is why everyone's so crazy about Alice Miller. She is, was a phenomenal psychologist just decades ahead of her time. Like she was talking about trauma and complex trauma without naming it that years before that ever came on the scene. And she unfortunately is now dead, but she left behind this legacy of books where it is a crime, in my opinion, that the only one that's well known right now is the drama of the gifted child because she writes spectacular books on religious trauma. And this is one that I would say is kind of half about sexual abuse, half about religious trauma. So if either of those are topics of interest to you, I really recommend this book. My personal favorite part of the book was the fact that she really deeply unpacks the phrase, you shall respect your father and your mother, which I think is used in a lot of families as a justification for parents maltreating their children and then using that phrase as a kind of get out of jail free card. And she talks a lot about how that creates a very complex inner world for the child, as well as a lot of other phrases that are used in religious conditioning. So if you have any sort of religious trauma or if you're just interested in exploring it as a topic, I highly recommend Alice Miller. I also know she has a book that's on my bookshelf that I haven't read yet called For Your Own Good that I believe tackles physical abuse. And she just does such a good job of translating how these dogmas and these ideologies that get passed down through generations really create internal conflict in children and also how it teaches them to kind of police their own thoughts in a way that is very unhealthy. So Body Never Lies by Alice Miller is a great place to start even if the drama of the gifted child did not blow you away. Book number five, back on the topic of spirituality, A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. So I read this book for the first time in 2018 and I put it down about three quarters of the way through and was like, this book is not the book for me at this time in my life, but I knew in the back of my mind, there will be a time in my life where this will be the book for me. I don't know if you've ever had that feeling. I've had that with a couple of books, including ones I read this year, where I was like, I don't feel ready for this book yet. I don't feel aligned with this book right now, but I can tell that the concepts within it will someday be important to me. And that's how I felt in 2018 when I read A Return to Love. And then when I read it this year, I was like, this is the year that I'm ready for it. This book is basically a condensed version of the book A Course in Miracles by Helen Schuchman, Schumann, Schuchman, I can never say her name right. But um, basically Marianne Williamson studied A Course in Miracles, which is a religious text, depending on who you ask, and took the main ideas and wrote them down in this book. And after rereading A Return to Love this year, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go check out A Course in Miracles because the ideas in Marianne Williamson's summary of it were so powerful for me. So I read half of A Course in Miracles. And if you've ever picked that book up, you know it is a crazy long book. On Audible, I think it was like 50 hours long. And I listened to half of it and realized that I should have just stopped at A Return to Love because A Course in Miracles is super interesting, but it's also very, very, um, inaccessible. Like it's just the concepts are presented at such a high level with absolutely no groundedness to them that it's like, you can read it for sure. But Marianne Williamson, honestly, in my opinion, just did such a good job of condensing it and making it very accessible and easy to understand and presenting the idea of spirituality, of faith, of God in such a down to earth way that I honestly think I got 10 times more out of Marianne Williamson's book on A Course in Miracles than I did out of the actual Course in Miracles. And I wanna note at this point, I am not religious myself. I can't remember if I already said that, probably, but Marianne Williamson is Jewish. And so some of her work has kind of a Jewish bent to it, but honestly, not really. Like she does a really good job of talking about spirituality in a way that is not dogmatically rooted in any one religion. So even if you are completely non-religious, I personally really enjoyed this book and I think that it's possible to enjoy it as someone who doesn't have a faith whatsoever. Book number four that I really loved this year, The Narcissistic Family by Stephanie Donaldson Pressman and Robert M. Pressman. What I really love about this book is that it tackles the issue that a lot of people have which is I don't feel like I grew up in a dysfunctional family. I feel like I came from a pretty stable, normal family, but I recognize myself in a lot of the symptomology of children who grew up in dysfunctional homes. 
So this book talks a lot about the kind of subtleties behind families that seem normal on the surface, but actually can create a lot of psychological damage to the children. So the term narcissistic in this title does not mean a person with narcissistic personality disorder. The narcissistic family just means a family that is oriented around serving the needs of the adults above the needs of the children. So this can happen for a variety of different ways. I will not unpack the whole book for you, but if you've ever had the feeling of, I feel like I have these kind of weird, either trauma responses or just issues that I see people who grew up in like alcoholic homes or something like that struggling with, but I don't feel like my family was overtly abusive, you should check out this book. It gives a really good overview of how seemingly normal families can give way to some really dysfunctional patterns. And it also does talk about more overtly dysfunctional or abusive homes. So it covers both bases. Third best book I read this year, and we are back to Bradshaw, Healing the Shame That Binds You by John Bradshaw. This book is just phenomenal. I have half of it highlighted. It talks about the role of what psychologists call toxic shame or a shame-based person. So someone who believes that at their core, they are kind of a mistake or fundamentally different from other people in a very shameful way. And that if anyone got too close, they would find out. And this is the root of all attachment wounds. So if you identify as insecurely attached in any way, whether it's avoidant, fearful avoidant, or anxious, this book gives a really good overview of what is kind of emotionally at the core of that and how to start working with that shame by bringing it to the surface making it conscious and then finding a way to develop an identity for yourself that is not rooted in deep shame. It is just such a good resource that tackles a topic that hardly anyone is willing to talk openly about. And I seriously cannot recommend this enough. This is such a good book, just so good. Second best book that I read this year, if you are following me on Twitter, you've probably already heard me mention this about a billion times, but The Fantasy Bond by Robert W. Firestone I don't know if a book has ever truly changed my worldview as much as this one. And that is saying a lot. This book really messed me up. <laughs> like I felt like glass was shattering in my brain, left, right, and center reading it. And there will truly, I do not say this lightly, forever be a before and after I read this book in my life. So The Fantasy Bond, once again, is not directly related to attachment, but it talks about the ways that we adapt ourselves to make up for a lack of healthy, true connection in the relationship we have with our caregivers and how as adults that causes us to put fantasy in place of actual relationships as adults, whether that means not having relationships so that we can keep the idea of the person we think we're gonna end up with kind of pure and preserved in our mind or constantly being in relationships where half of the relationship is happening inside of your head in the world that you've invented. And even though it's not overtly about attachment, I truly think that this was the book that helped me understand for the first time in my life on a deeply felt level, what secure attachment is supposed to be like and what it's supposed to feel like. And I think that before I read this book, I couldn't even conceptualize in a really kind of bone deep way what it would feel like to be secure. And this was truly the first book that gave me a concept of that. And that was monumental, instrumental, completely necessary in my own healing process this year. And I feel genuine love for this book like it is a human being who I personally know which is also fun to think about because books have personalities and this book's personality is harsh and bleak, but very illuminating. For my Myers-Briggs crowd, this book is a giant TI DOM, probably an INTP. All right, book number one. I don't know whether to tell you that this is the best book I read this year or the best book that I read ever in my life, but it's definitely the former, maybe the latter. And this book, once again, you've probably heard me reference a million times if you follow me on Twitter, but it is Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. So when I first read this book, I remember tweeting, we should just replace the entire DSM with this book which was kind of a joke, but only kind of. I really think that in five to 10 years from now, the way that we look at trauma is going to completely revolutionize the way that we deal with absolutely all mental health disorders. And this book we are going to look back on as so far ahead of its time, it's absurd. But you do not have to identify as having PTSD or complex PTSD to read this book. I definitely did not identify as having complex PTSD before reading this book. And then I got so much out of it that I became like anxiously attached to this book. I'm not even kidding. Like for a period of about two months, I took this book literally everywhere with me. It introduced me to the idea of emotional flashbacks, which people with complex PTSD have. And that 
concept and being able to name it and understand how to work with it is maybe one of the best mental health tools that I've ever found anywhere ever. So he has what he calls 13 steps for managing emotional flashbacks, which are one of the core symptoms of complex PTSD that I'm gonna make an entire video unpacking because they are so good that for a period of two months, I brought this book with me everywhere. Like I just put this book in my backpack and any time I left my house for more than 24 hours, I brought this book with me. I went on weekend trips with this book. I went hiking with this book. I brought this book on bus trips and airplanes. I would not go anywhere without this book for two months because it was such a humongous resource for me mental health wise that I literally felt like this book has to be on my person at all times. So again, I'll probably make a video about this book in particular, but it just goes over so many different mental health issues in such an intelligent and nuanced way that I actually recommend it for literally anyone who in any way struggles with mental health issues of any sort. Again, you don't have to identify as having PTSD or complex PTSD, but if you have ever had a mental health issue, especially if you have ongoing or a plethora of mental health issues, this book is so good, so good. Just go get it. Don't even listen to me talk about it anymore. Okay, now honorable mentions. So I divided the honorable mentions up into four categories and they are spiritual books, creativity books, productivity books, and psychology books. So spiritual books, The Places That Scare You by Pema Chodron. That was a great book. I think last year I recommended When Things Fall Apart by her. She is NFP crack, if you are an ENFP or an INFP, or like any type, but I think particularly ENFPs and INFPs will find that her writing style is very conducive to the way that NFPs think. I would bet money that one of those two types are hers as well, but she is a Buddhist monk who lives in Canada and she has some amazing work. So The Places That Scare You is a really good overview of how to sit with discomfort and how to tolerate discomfort, which if you're on an attachment healing journey in any capacity is going to be incredibly important for you. And this is a really good book to help you navigate that. Next virtual book that I finally read this year that I can't not recommend, The Power of Now. The Power of Now is one of those books where it had been recommended to me so many times that I just started telling people I had read it so they would stop talking to me about it. And then for a while, because it was so commonly recommended to me, I just didn't read it because I felt like I'd already read it because so many people had told me about it. Um, but this year I finally read it and I was like, God damn it, it's a really good book. It's really good. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you any more about it because you've probably either already read it or had it explained to you 5,000 times. But I'm just here to tell you that it does live up to the hype if you're wondering whether or not it lives up to the hype as I was before this year. And this one I didn't know whether to put in the spiritual or the psychology category, but the book Why Buddhism is True by Robert Wright was also a really good read. It just talked about how the principles of Buddhist philosophies, even if you don't ascribe to the religion itself, is really great for helping us live a more healthy and balanced life. It probably should have been in the psychology category. But anyways, it's a really good book and I like that it was written by someone who self-identifies as being terrible at meditation and who is not a naturally Zen person. I think that Robert Wright is probably also an NP, maybe like an INTP. So if you've ever felt yourself being kind of attracted to Buddhism, but thinking I'm not calm enough, I'm not Zen enough, I can't meditate well enough, this is a really good book that talks about how to approach it from that angle. Um, Creativity books. So I finally read Big Magic this year by Elizabeth Gilbert. I didn't like Eat, Pray, Love. So I was like, I'm not gonna read Big Magic. I don't really think Elizabeth Gilbert speaks to me. Then I started following her on Instagram and was like, oh, everything she says speaks to me on here. So then I bought Big Magic finally, and it was a phenomenal book. And I recommend listening to it on Audible if you can, because she narrates it and the way that she speaks and the emphasis she puts on certain parts is actually just like very nice to listen to. You can really tell which parts of her own book she loves the most and is the most proud of. And I thought that that was just kind of cool. I think in particular that if you have FI, if you are an ENFP, INFP, ISFP, or ESFP, this book is gonna be really good for you because it talks about creative energy in a very down to earth way. It kind of like takes a zoomed out perspective on the life of creative people and isn't just about like, here's how you sit down and get to work. It's about like how you live your entire life in a way that helps you be creative overall. So it's not just about producing, it's about living creatively. And I think that that's a really unique thing in a book about creativity. So I do highly recommend this book. Next creativity classic that I finally read this year from beginning to end, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. If you are a writer in any capacity and for some reason you have not heard of The Artist's Way, you definitely wanna go pick it up. But it's also just a really great book for thinking about creativity from any angle. So if you're a creative of any sort, and especially if you are a creative of any sort who is looking to 
form some sort of routine around their creativity, some sort of spiritual practice around their creativity. The Artist's Way is a very famous book that provides a very well-renowned system for keeping yourself kind of creatively sharp. And it also just presents some really cool, really interesting ideas, so I totally recommend picking it up if someone has not already gifted it to you. I feel like it's a very commonly gifted book, and for good reason. Last creativity book, um, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Well, I can't remember if this was in The Road Less Traveled or The War of Art. I read them both on the same day on Audible. So it's like, I know it was in one of those books that I read that day. I think it was The War of Art. Um, they talk about using relationships as a distraction from creativity and the creative process. And I thought that that was a really interesting angle to take. But The War of Art kind of talks about resistance to creative work in a way that I found very helpful as someone who has dealt with a massive amount of creative resistance in my life. I would actually say that's a very prevailing theme for me. So if that's something you're struggling with, The War of Art is a great read for that. Productivity books, I did not read many of this year. And the ones that I did read are kind of the two like top ones that people recommend for productivity. Um, one is Atomic Habits by James Clear. I've recommended this multiple times in other videos. It is a really great book on being aware of the habits that you are forming without realizing you're forming them and how you can upgrade your habits and make them sustainable by making them things that you actually want to do because they feel like extensions of who you are. So it's a really great book, I think, for intuitive perceiving types like myself who can struggle with keeping habits afloat because it talks about them in a pretty realistic way. That's all I'm gonna say about that. The other one I read is Deep Work by Cal Newport. You have probably heard a bunch about this book already, but it talks a lot about how to focus deeply by reducing distractions and also by making sure that you are setting clear boundaries between when you are working and focusing and when you are letting your mind wander and play because both of those things, he argues, are very important for concentrating and I have found that to be incredibly true. So once again, if you are wondering whether or not those two books live up to the hype, they do. And last but not least, my psychology honorable mentions. Okay, I've already talked about this one in the family scapegoating video called Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed, Help and Hope for Adults in the Family Scapegoat Role by Rebecca C. Manville. If you identify as the scapegoat in the dysfunctional family roles system, Highly recommend picking up this book. It gives a really good overview of what that might mean for you as an adult. It cross-references Pete Walker's work on CPTSD with the family scapegoat role. Just an awesome book overall. Highly recommend picking it up if you are curious about dysfunctional family roles. Mother Hunger by Kelly McDaniel. This is one of those books where if I had read it earlier in the year, I feel pretty certain it would have been on my top 10 list. So this is a new book. I believe it came out in 2020 and it talks about a range of different attachment related theories and brings them all together in a really comprehensive, really easy to understand way. And I highly recommend this book if you have an interest in attachment style. It's a phenomenal read and it's very up to date with all of the latest theories. It also incorporates a lot of polyvagal theory, I believe, if I remember correctly. So it's got all of the newest research. So it contextualizes stuff in a really cool way. And it's just overall very interesting and well-written. The Upward Spiral by Alex Korb. Read it if you have depression. It talks about little day-to-day -day changes you can make that can reverse the kind of downward spiral of depression and help you start getting slowly and slowly into a healthier mindset by making tiny incremental changes. And it was a book that I read at a time when I was feeling depression kind of creep back into my worldview. And I really did find it quite helpful for both reframing what was going through my mind at that time and also creating small kind of structural differences inside of my own life that I implemented to carry me through that period that really did help me kind of keep my head above water. This is another one I've recommended multiple times, but Adult Children of Alcoholics by Janet, I can never say her last name right, Geringer Wojtitz, I think I got that right. You do not have to be an adult child of an alcoholic in order to benefit from this book. It just gives an overview of symptoms that you might be facing if you grew up in any sort of family dysfunction. You could have grown up with a completely sober home and you could still super relate to this book. So if you relate to anything in either the CBTSD book or the narcissistic family book, I think that you will find this book to be a very natural extension of those ones. And it's super short. It does not take long to read at all. Also note that it was written quite a while ago. So there are some outdated components to this book. And last but definitely not least, the book Homecoming by John Bradshaw is a really nice introduction to reparenting work. So if you are interested in doing any sort of inner child work, but you don't know where to start, John Bradshaw gives a really good overview of how to start picturing and thinking about your inner child. And he is a very nice writer. Like he just explains things in a very kind of soft and compassionate way. I think he was probably an NFP. And this book is a really good intro to that. Okay, so those were my books of 2021 that I really loved. 
I will obviously be back here next year with a list that is hopefully a little bit shorter than this year's. But if you are still here watching at this point, kudos to you for sticking around. And let me know in the comments what the best book that you read this year was. I am actually really curious about what you guys are reading because if you're here, we probably have very similar interests and I would love to know, love, love, love to know what books you guys found were awesome resources for you in the year 2021 and maybe that will make it into my next year's best books of 2022 reading list. But for now, happy new year's. I love you guys. And I will see you again back here next year.